Do you want your life to have greater purpose? Something that gives you a reason to wake up in the morning and helps you shift your perspective. Something that would help you address and overcome personal and life challenges. And, and what if this thing also helped you to build deep relationships and ultimately revitalize your spiritual and your physical well-being? Tell me, is that something that you would be interested in knowing more about? And, and what if a simple shift in your life our lives? What if this allowed us to experience all of those things that Brenna just mentioned? And no, we're not trying to sell you some supplements or get you to sign up for a self-help course. What we're actually looking at today will bring all those benefits to our lives. So if you're new to Pure Art Church's online campus, we would love to connect with you. We're so glad you're joining us. Go to pureart.org slash connect so we can say hi. But ultimately, whether you're a new person or you're a longtime viewer, we're so glad that you're joining us today. So let's see how all of our lives can experience greater purpose. Welcome, Welcome to, to church. church. He's the God of all creation. And he's been good through all the ages. That's true. Push or pull, he never changes. He never changes. He's the God who moves mountains. Would you sing that with us? He's the God who moves the mountains and he reconciles. He reconciles the brokenhearted. And in him we found redemption. Redemption. So we respond by singing glory to the one. Glory to the one who holds it all. Glory to the one who saved my soul. To the one who I adore. Praise the Lord. Glory to the one who reigns on high. Glory to the God who saved my life. To the Never leaves us. We're singing about that now. He's the God who never leaves us. Always faithful. He's faithful through the generations. Hey, so what else can we do but worship? Thank you, Jesus.
Dr. Keltner, professor of psychology at UC Berkeley and director of the Greater Good Science Center, has spent the last two decades of his life studying awe and wonder with brain science, which he says is distinct, awe and wonder is distinct from joy or fear, and how experiencing awe can positively affect our bodies, our relationships, and how we see the world around us. Keltner says that we need to inject more awe into our daily lives because one of the regions of our brain is deactivated when we experience awe. The default mode network. Did you catch that? The default mode network. This is where all of our self-representational processes take place, where we focus on, let me break it down for you, on ourselves. Our time, our goals, our strivings, our checklists, are all the things that are about me, myself, and I. That all quiets down during awe. Then awe activates, watch this, so that whole area that's focused on self quiets down in our brain. And then awe activates our vargus nerve, which is a big bundle of nerves starting at the top of our spinal cord. This area, when it's fired up in our brain, this helps us to see people all around us better. Just, it slows down our heart rate, helps us with digestion, come on, opens up our minds to things bigger than ourselves, cools inflammation in our physical bodies, and strengthens our immune system that attacks disease in our body. This is a big deal. And this finding fascinates me because the Bible tells us that the fear of the Lord, which this word fear in the Hebrew language is awe and reverence and wonder of God, is the beginning of wisdom. Now, I wanna show you something today that fills me with great awe, jaw-dropping awe. Not mountains and oceans and things in God's creation, which yes, that all fills me with awe, but I wanna to talk to you about something that we often miss, something I think that on a regular basis, we don't understand. So we just finished a series called Sent, and we were talking about all the things that Jesus was sent to accomplish, four things. Now we're gonna shift in a brand new series that's gonna be called Sent as well, Sent Part Two, and now we're gonna shift to what Jesus has sent us to do. Let me show you a jaw-dropping statement that we often miss from Jesus. John chapter 20, verse 19 is where we're gonna start. Now this is right after the resurrection, it's that Sunday evening, all right? It says this, that Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Think about this for a moment. They're afraid, they're hiding out in this room, and all of a sudden, door is locked, though Jesus just appears in their midst. Hello, have you ever been really anxious and then a friend startled you? Yeah, scares you half out of your mind? This is a, a powerful moment. Surprise, Jesus shows up in the room, they think he's dead, now they go to the tomb, he's not there, and boom, he appears to them. Then Jesus says this, verse 19 through 22. Peace be with you. <laughs> okay, you just startled us. Now, peace be with you. Then he said, as he spoke to them, he showed them the wounds in his hands and side, and they were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Again, he said, peace be with you. Now, here's the statement. Don't miss this today. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, that last part, receive the Holy Spirit, we're gonna talk more about that in part three in the month of May as we look at sent part three, sent with power. We're gonna talk about our relationship with the Holy Spirit in the month of May. I can't wait for that series. But meanwhile, at sent part two, I'm in awe that Jesus is sending us. I mean, what were they thinking in that moment? As the Father sent me, Jesus said, now I'm going to send you. What? They had watched Jesus for three years heal the sick, teach with power and authority like they had never heard any rabbi ever teach, and love, love, like they had never seen anyone love before, literally laying his life down for them. And this is a crazy illustration, but go with me for a second, all right? Imagine you're watching a World's Strongest Man competition. I don't know if you've ever seen this, but like where guys are lifting giant barrels and you know, the backs of, of buses. Um, I saw one one time where this guy, literally they were pulling an airplane a picture's coming up on your screen right now so you can see what I'm talking about. They were pulling an airplane. Come on. And can you imagine in this moment, you see this guy pull an airplane, he turns around, looks at you, hands you the harness and says, now I'm sending you to do exactly what I just did. To me, that pales in comparison, but it gives you an idea. They had seen Jesus do miraculous, amazing things. And then he turns and he looks at them in this room and he says, as the Father has sent me, 
Now, I am sending you. So for the next three weeks, I want to show us three things, actually three attitudes that Jesus has sent us to live out in this hurting and broken world. So the story we're gonna look at today is found in Mark chapter 10. So go with me in your Bibles to Mark chapter 10. If you don't have your Bible, follow along on the screen. Here we go, we're gonna put the verses up for you, starting in verse 35. So understand as we set this up, Jesus has just told the disciples and told the crowd that was following him that he was heading to Jerusalem and then he is gonna be beaten, spit upon, he's gonna be crucified, he's gonna be killed by the Roman government, and then he is gonna rise from the dead. So he makes that statement, which had to blow their minds. Then this story takes place. Watch this. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, right after Jesus says he's going to be beaten, spit upon, crucified, dead and buried, rise again. James and John come up to him, the sons of Zebedee, and they go, hey, teacher, they said, we want you to do us a favor. Like, you ever have a friend that has horrible timing? Like, this is crazy. All right, do us a favor. One translation said, Lord, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Isn't that the ultimate prayer? Isn't that what we all pray? Lord, do whatever we ask you to do. Jesus had to look at it, and I don't know how Jesus looked at him, but he probably was like, okay. He says, what's your request, he asked. They replied, when you sit on your glorious throne, we want to sit in places of honor next to you, one on the right, the other on the left. But Jesus said to them, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the bitter cup of suffering I'm about to drink? Are you able to be baptized with the baptism of suffering I must be baptized with? Watch their response. Oh yes, they replied, we are able. Then Jesus told them, you will indeed drink from my cup and be baptized with my baptism of suffering, but I have no right to say who will sit on my right and who's gonna sit on my left. God has prepared those places for the ones he has chosen. When the 10 other disciples, watch this, heard what James and John had asked, they were indignant, they were hacked off. So Jesus calls a family meeting because he wants to make sure to keep unity here. He sees that they're all upset. He calls a meeting, calls them all together and listen to what Jesus said. Here's where I wanna camp out today. You know that the rulers in this world lorded over their people. And officials flaunt their authority over those under them. Like James and John, you know, you ask for positions of authority. And we know that's kind of the way the world does it. And I can understand why you would desire that. But whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And I love how he starts this. He says, but among you, it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be the slave of everyone else. For even the Son of Man, here it is, for even the Son of Man, Jesus talking about himself, came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. So here we go, family. We're gonna dive in week one of the second part of the Sent series, Sent to Serve. Sent to Serve, that's the attitude. Listen, listen closely. This is a foundational attitude for the mission that Jesus has given us as his followers. This is the mindset that he wants us to have. It's all about humility. And humility isn't thinking less of yourself, like I'm just a, a terrible person, I'm not good enough, I'm just really low. No, that's not thinking less of yourself, but it's thinking about yourself less. And this is hard to do. This requires Holy Spirit power and revelation that we're gonna talk more about in the month of, it, of May. Now. I've been reading the Bible since I was able to read. I, I've probably read the Bible cover to cover at least a minimum of 25 times in my lifetime. I have never caught this verse I'm about to share with you before. I feel like the Holy Spirit just put this in there, which I know he didn't, but it feels like it. Titus chapter two, verse 14. This is, Titus is writing, he's speaking about Jesus. Listen to what he writes, this is so good. He gave his life, Jesus, gave his life, what did he give his life for? to free us, to ransom us, we just read about, that Jesus said he was going to do, to free us from every kind of sin, to cleanse us and make us his very own people, totally committed to doing good deeds. Like he laid down his life to set us free so that we could serve other people and do good for other people. Listen, Jesus didn't just save us from something, he saved us for something. Jesus frees us. He makes us his very own family, and then he moves our heart to do good by serving other people. Understand what Jesus has done for us today. Please get your hearts around this today. This is what he has sent us to do as well. He's modeled this for us, because freedom 
creates a new position with a new mission. I want to say that again. It's important. Freedom creates a new position, God's family, with a new mission. When Titus says that Jesus set us free, that means two powerful things. First of all, that we were all prisoners to sin. We all wrestle with sin and we were slaves to sin. And that secondly, Jesus paid the price to set us free, to ransom us, to purchase us out of slavery into freedom. And I know some people, you push back on this. You're like, oh, wait a minute. I'm not a prisoner. I'm free to do whatever I want. Really? Let me ask you a question. Do you have anything in your life that you keep doing over and over and over again that you wish you just could stop doing? Wrestle with it for a second. Is there an anger? Do you blow up? Do you get angry? Do you get mad? Is there just something you keep doing? Is there a habit? Is there something you keep doing all the time that you're just like, I wish I could stop doing this. I want to stop. You wake up on Monday morning, go, this is my day. I'm going to honor God in this area of my life. And by Monday at two o'clock, you're already doing that thing you wish you wouldn't have done. You see, the greatest prisoner is the one who doesn't even know that they are a prisoner. That's the greatest bondage. It's a person who is enslaved to something and doesn't even realize that they are. You see, the person in bondage to greed just thinks that they're self-motivated and eager to succeed. The person who is in bondage to anger just thinks, no, I'm self, I'm protecting myself. I'm standing up for myself. I'm just a truth teller. See, the biggest issue with sin is that it creates slavery to self. We're consumed with ourselves. We are, we become the center of the universe and we're always offended. We're comparing ourselves to others all the time and we're self-focused because we are in awe of ourselves. We can't see other people because we're so consumed with ourselves. But remember the golden rule, do unto others as you would have done unto yourself. When you're totally consumed with yourself, you can't even think about doing unto others. You're just focused about <laughs> getting what's good for me. Let me give you a really tough exercise. If you do this every day, all right, I'm not talking about push-ups, sit-ups, those types of things, pull-ups. Let's forget about that, all right? You used to be able to do those. But let me give you a tough mental exercise that you can do every day. Ask yourself this question at the end of every day before you go to bed. Did I meet the needs of others today with all the passion and speed and creativity and joy that I met my own needs today? That's a great way of knowing if you are doing unto others as you would have done to yourself. See, Jesus' greatest act of service was to pay the price for my freedom. He set me free from sin. It no longer owns me anymore, no longer controls me anymore. I have the freedom and the power of Christ to overcome all that comes my way. And then he calls us to serve others with that same attitude. Now, now we're not the savior of the world. We can't fix people, heal people, set people free from sin, but we can serve with the same humility and attitude of Jesus. See, unless we own our need to be set free by Jesus, we won't fully own our mission to serve other people. And let me show you what I mean. Let's, let's take a moment and let's reflect. Let's remember how intense it was for Jesus to do what he did for us on the cross to set us free. In Mark chapter 10, verse 38, let's back up and look at this again. This is what Jesus said. But Jesus said to them, you know, the, the two disciples come and they go, hey, can we get seats of honor? One on your left, one on your right. Can we, can we do that? And Jesus says to them, hey, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering that I'm about to drink? Are you able to be baptized with the baptism of suffering I'm about to be baptized with? Now, the cup had a meaning. And the meaning of the cup in the Old Testament was always the cup of God's wrath and God's judgment. Even in Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, moved by the heart of God, said, you know, talking about God's judgment and the cup of judgment, said, you will drink it to the dregs. And he's like, I'm going to pour out my wrath on your rebellion and your, and your rejection of me. I mean, God hates sin. And some of us, we get upset with this and we say, man, how can God how can I serve and love a God? How can you, Dan, serve and love a God who judges and has wrath and anger like that? Well, if you're a father or a mother and you see something destroying your child, let me promise you something. There's going to be anger. If there's not anger, there's absolutely no love. When God sees the destruction of sin on his creation, there's anger in that. He poured out all of his anger on sin, on Christ, 
on the cross. We have to get our minds around how intense this was. And just for a moment, just listen to this for a moment. My, my wife, Nicole, and I, my incredibly, incredible wife, you talk about a servant. My wife has been serving these two amazing, beautiful girls that God has given us over the last two years, and Olivia and Ava. Let me, let me give you an update on pictures. Here. Here's a new picture of Olivia. Isn't she the cutest thing you've ever seen? And then look at Ava. Look at the smile on this kid. This, this kid just lights up the world with her smile. But recently, we had our, a court date and on, in this court date, they went from severance now to adoption, where we're going to be able to adopt Ava. We adopted Olivia back in September, and now we are moving towards adoption with Ava, and that's all been set by the courts. But to go through that process of listening to the state talking about what Ava has gone through and her exposure to drugs at her birth, same as her, as her, sister, as her sister Olivia, and I have to tell you, when I look at the food disorder stuff that Olivia wrestles with, she's still not able to eat food with texture. She's two and a half years old and she's still not able to eat real food because of the gag reflex and the sensory reflexes of being addicted to drugs at birth. There's an anger at drugs and what the fentanyl epidemic has done in our world. Our little girls were born addicted to fentanyl. And to listen to what's going on in this court case, to listen to what the, the judge is saying, to listen to what the DCS department is saying, about what these girls are going through. And to look at Ava with her distended stomach and issues that she has with her reflex issues. And now we gotta take her through a whole bunch of tests at Phoenix Children's Hospital to deal with these issues of being born addicted to drugs. There's an anger in that. And then you know what else there's an anger at? What drugs has done to their mom? My wife's first cousin. And that she's on the streets and she's broken and she's hurting because of addiction, because of the sin and brokenness of this world, and I gotta tell you, there's just an anger towards what's happening in our world today in the area of addiction. I, I love her, I love people dealing with this, but there is a, there's a righteous indignation about this issue has to stop in our world. It just has to stop. It's a crisis that we face with addiction. And we are now at our southern border here in Arizona. 60% of fentanyl in our country comes in through Arizona's Tucson sector. And so it rises up within me. And without understanding the wrath of God against sin and brokenness and the pain of this world and what sin does, we'll never have an understanding of how much Jesus loved us on the cross. And here's what I believe. I believe that Jesus saw the cup of the wrath of God against sin. I believe that in the garden, he saw the cup that he was going to drink full of the wrath of God for sin, poured out on him. And the Bible says that he sweat like great, great drops of blood from his forehead. See, God the Father set the cup in front of Jesus in the garden and said, here it is, my son. This is what it's gonna cost to save mankind from their sin, to set them free, to ransom them. Will you drink it, son? Will you serve them by laying down your life for them? Can you imagine how terrifying that cup must have been? Do you know how much stress and pressure you have to be in to force blood out of the capillaries on the forehead? Do you have any idea? No, we don't. We can't even wrap our minds around it. And we don't, you know why? Because so often we just wanna be comfortable. We just wanna be comfortable. Think about what Jesus went through, how uncomfortable he was so that we could be set free. Think about how he served us today. Now watch Jesus, go back to Mark 10, verse 43. And then he says, but among you, it's gonna be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be a slave of everyone else. For even the son of man came not to be served, but to serve others, here it is, and to give his life as a ransom for many. You see, a person who serves others makes them feel valuable. Like they matter. When you think about what Jesus has done for you, it makes you feel valuable. Like I matter. I was worth the price of Christ on the cross. No one has ever loved me like that. And here's why. Here's why people who serve others make people feel valuable. Because they're not the most important person in the conversation anymore. They're not just focused on themselves. They're focused on others. Bonhoeffer once said, it's a natural impulse of the human heart that when we meet someone immediately, we look for a position of strategic superiority. That when we meet somebody for the first time, we immediately think about how we have it together and maybe they don't. We automatically think, what does this person think of me? Is this the kind of person I wanna be around? This is how we size people up. A servant thinks, 
man, I want to listen to see how I can serve this, how I can help this person, how I can make their life better, how I can add value to them. My father is a servant. I have not seen anybody else on planet Earth that I know personally serve like my dad over the years. Um, he called me the other day, and my dad's going through a lot of pain right now. He has four compression fractures in his back. Um, I don't know how he makes it to church, but he does. And he comes every weekend still. He comes on Wednesdays to pray with my mom here at the church. For the, he prays for the church every Wednesday. He's in massive. Matter of fact, I asked him, I asked him on Easter. I said, Dad, how are you feeling at church? And he goes, I'm in a lot of pain, son but I'm really proud of you and I'm glad to be here today. I called him the other day and I asked him just before Easter, I said, how you doing, dad? He said, I'm hurting. He said, but I'm, I'm gonna be okay. And I said, he said, what are you doing, son? He immediately, in all of his pain, asked me, what are you doing? What's going on in your life? How are you doing? I'm praying for you, son. And then I said this, I'm so busy. I went through the list of all the things I'm doing and there was a pause, it was really quiet. I thought, is my dad okay? Is he, is he still there? Did he hang up? What happened? And then he said this, he whispered this, he said, man, I wish I could be out there helping you. In the midst of my dad's pain, what he misses the most is being able to help other people. My father serves people, has served people his whole life as a Jesus follower. And it's become part of his very nature. It's part of his identity. It's what he's known for. I think of so many people. I think of Ed, my, one of my security guards at Pure Heart, who, who watches over us on the weekend and makes sure our campus at Glendale is safe. Um, he's always looking for ways to serve me. It's amazing. Uh, if we're doing communion that weekend, I walk in the back room to get ready to, to pray, to head out to, the, out to the auditorium, and Ed will be standing there waiting for me to get there, and he'll hand me a communion cup. So I make sure you had this today. We're doing communion today, Pastor. Every day, when I, every Sunday when I leave church, he, go, he walks me out to my car, and before we get out the back door, he always says, make sure you wash your hands, Pastor. You don't want to take anything home to those beautiful little girls that you've got. I have this um, drink that I drink every um, between second and third service on Sunday mornings live on campus. And it's, uh, it's uh, magnesium. And I, I take it because it just helps me with some of my rhythm issues with my heart. And it's just, it's just a, a great supplement. And uh, so I drink the supplement every, every week and it just really helps me to that last service because I'm exhausted. And so he always says to me before the last service, did you drink your drink yet, Pastor? Did you drink your drink yet? And I always worry, is anybody else hearing him like, what drinks Pastor Dan drinking? No, it's magnesium. That's what it is, all right? He's always thinking of the little things that I need, because that's what a servant does. That's what someone with an attitude of serving does. Uh, we've raised our, our oldest kids, our first three, we've raised them to be people that serve. We want them to, when they go to someone's house, you clear the dishes, you help out after dinner, you look for ways to serve, to make that house better, to bless the people that you're hanging out with. I tell them, our kids all the time, when you work, when you go to your job, don't just do your job well, but look around when you're done with your job, that you've done with excellence, and smile and say, I get to do this, and then turn around and find out who else can you help do their job. It's not just about getting what you need to get done, it's helping other people around you. If you have an attitude of, I get to do this, you will always have a good job. And you always be in line to get a raise because service in our world today is horrible. And so I've told our kids, you serve others, you will be blessed. And don't do it just to be blessed. Do it because this is what Jesus has done for you. Uh, just a side note on something that I do, and please, I'm not trying to toot my own horn. Just go with this for a second. I love, when I get my hair cut, I love to sweep up the hair afterwards. I know, it's weird. Um, the other day, I was at Great Clips and I was get, they don't pay me for this, by the way. This is not product placement, all right? But I was at Great Clips and I got done getting my hair cut. It was a different girl cutting my hair than I normally have. And I've been going to this location now for just over a year. And so I go to get the broom and I start to sweep and I handed her my credit card and I got the broom. And as, I turned, as she turned around, she looked where I was at and she could see I was sweeping the floor and she goes, oh, you're the guy. Oh, you're the guy. And I was like, what does that mean? She goes, oh, I heard about you. I'm like, what do you mean? She goes, I heard about this guy who sweeps up the hair after they're done cutting his hair. And in my mind, I'm thinking, I hope that's a positive thing. Like, I heard about the wacko that does this every week when he gets his, every two weeks when he gets his hair cut. But it's just that little thing that now has built a reputation. It's just a small thing like that that's built a reputation at Great Clips that you're the guy. You're the guy that cleans up his hair. And my dad taught me that. But more importantly, Jesus modeled the life of a servant. And he's called me in the little things of my life, in the big things of my life, to serve other people. Let's talk about marriage for a second. All right, hang in there. No relationship gives us more opportunity to serve than our marriages because we get laziest around those that we're closest to. 
Now, shadow side for me is on Fridays, my day off, I take Fridays off. On Friday, I love to tell my wife all the things I've done for her that day. I, I love to give her the list of, you know, I did this today, I did that today, I did this today. You know what a servant does? A servant doesn't announce all their great deeds. A servant just does it because they love. How can you serve your family? How can you serve your wife? Marriage is a great opportunity to serve. So here's a big question for us this week. Where are you serving? Where, where are you? Are you giving up your time and your treasure for other people? What are you doing to help others in your church family? You know, right here at Pure Heart. You know, what, what, what are you doing to serve? If you, you're watching around the world or around the country, where are you serving in your neighborhood? Where are you serving in your community? How are you serving your family? How are you serving your neighbors? In your family, are you known as a servant? Are you a giver? Or are you a taker? What's your reputation? Let me bring something up on the screen for you right now. For those of you in the greater Phoenix area that attend our Glendale campus or our Peoria campus from time to time, or you're able to attend, I wanna encourage you, get involved in our church family. Get involved in serving in the community. Get involved in serving on one of our campuses. We need your help. How are you serving your church family? So here's, the, here's where you can go, pureheart.org slash serve. pureheart.org forward slash serve. There's a whole list of opportunities for you to be involved in the community, around our church campuses, just to get involved. But if you don't live in the greater Phoenix area, I wanna encourage you, serve in your community. Get involved at a food bank, make a difference. Get outside of just making money to pay bills all the time. And do something to give your life away. Find a need and meet it. That's what my pastor said growing up, and I'll never forget it. Find a need and meet it. And that's the story of my life. I had a friend of mine when I was 20 years of age. I was playing softball on the church softball team that I grew up, the church I grew up in. I was playing softball. I was walking down the hallway one day after service. A friend of mine walked up to me who I played softball with. He said, hey, I have a boys junior high Sunday school class. I have 30 boys in there. They're bouncing off the walls. I need somebody to help me. I don't have a partner in that class. I need somebody to help me. Just take attendance and be a bouncer. And I'm like, okay. I felt God bumped my heart to do that. That was my very first step into serving in ministry. My friend got sick six months later, couldn't do the Sunday morning message, called me up, said, hey, Dan, I don't feel good. Would you do the devotion in the morning? I'm like, I don't do devotions. I do attendance and bouncing. That's what I do. He's like, man, I need you to do this. So I, I was scared out of my mind, but I did it. I did this little devotional about David and Saul. I didn't remember what I talked about, but I got done with that little message. I gave an invitation for those boys to receive Jesus. And two of the toughest kids in that class raised their hand and said, I wanna give my life to Jesus today. When those kids left, I broke and I cried. The next morning, I got a call from my aunt-in-law. She called me up and said, hey, our church is looking for a, a, a youth pastor. We heard that you're in youth ministry. I'm like, yeah, I take attendance in a boys' Sunday school class. I said, I'm not really in youth ministry, but I help out in a Sunday school class. She goes, oh, our pastor would love to talk to you. I walked into an interview. He gave me an internship, 50 bucks a week in 1993. And today I'm the senior pastor of Pure Heart. How did it happen? I just started serving. So you're like, well, I don't feel like I have any special abilities and talents. I don't even know what to do. Here's what I know about God. Here's what I personally know about God. God blesses availability and not ability. I made myself available to be used by God and he has done things in my life that I never dreamed or imagined. Just step out and start serving. You may be blown away with what God wants to do with your life. And, and one last question, let's get to a heart level, attitude level. Is our serving more about us than others? Do we do things that we just want to do, that make us feel good, that bring us recognition? Are we willing to do things that maybe are hard or uncomfortable that no one will ever see that we've done or recognize? Do we just serve people that we like? You see, Jesus serves selfish people. Do we? Do we just serve people that feel like they deserve it? Remember, when we live a life of a servant, we position our soul to live with more awe and wonder. Because when we live for ourselves, the self part of our brain is always active and we're always focused on ourselves. It's hard to live with awe when we are the center of the universe. You see, a selfish person is more awful than they are awe-inspiring. When we think of ourselves less, and think of others more and doing good for others more, that Vargas nerve is activated in our brain and awe enters our brain and we are stronger. More importantly, we're living more like Jesus. 
for the sake of others. So family, here's where we're going to stop, right here. This is week one. The next two weeks, we're going to dive into some other issues, some other attitudes, some other mindsets that Jesus has sent us to live out in this world. But let's just start with this one. Where are you at? Where are you serving? And what's your attitude in your serving? Are you doing it to honor Jesus or are you doing it to get honor for yourself? Do a servant check this week. Do a heart check this week. And step out and start serving the people around you. Take on the same attitude of Jesus. Pray with me for just a moment. First of all, for some of you right now today, you're just like, I don't even know where to begin. I don't know what to do. Lord, I just pray for everyone that's watching today that you will move our hearts to want to do good because of what you've done for us. Let us be overwhelmed and filled with awe that you would love us so much that you would lay your life down for us to set us free, to give us a new position as your children, and then call us and send us into this broken world to do good. And now I just wanna pray for some of you today who are ready to make the most important decision of your life. There's some of you today who for the first time in your life are ready to say yes to the leadership of Jesus. Others, maybe today's more of a rededication of your life to Christ. So if that's you for the first time, or today you wanna rededicate your life to Jesus, this is the moment, greatest decision of your life. Pray this with me in your heart. Jesus hears you. Say this, Lord Jesus, in this moment, I commit my life to follow you, to trust you with my life. Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Thank you for your forgiveness, Lord. Would you fill me with your very presence? Fill me with your hope and your joy and your peace and your love and your awe. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. Have a strong week, everybody. Cannot wait to see you next week. I just love that statement that Dan said where Jesus didn't just come to save us from something. He came to save us for something. It really, it flips that wrong perspective that I had of God. I know for so many years, I'd always been so afraid that maybe I wasn't saved. I didn't measure up. God was angry at me. I didn't meet his expectations. It was really pretty self-consuming and miserable to live in that mindset. And I did it for a lot of years. And because of that, I never even thought to look for the opportunities that he was calling me to. Opportunities to love and serve others in new ways. And that was where life and purpose could be found. Yeah, and please let us know in the comments what God showed you during today's service, where he wants you to serve. Also, I know there are so many of you from Easter or from just a few minutes ago who accepted Christ into your life. And we just wanna say we are so happy for you and we wanna get on the right track for this new journey that God has you on. We wanna walk with you. So go to pureheart.org forward slash hand raised so that we can get you some of those next steps um, and make sure that you hit subscribe or you follow on the platform that you're watching this on because guess what we don't want you to miss out on all the amazing things that god is doing through our scent series yeah and also we have some guests next week that they are going to share some unbelievable stories that i guarantee will impact each and every one of you and that's why we don't want you to miss out and then also next week we're going to be celebrating some exciting and totally unexpected things that happen on this online campus over Easter. But this week, we actually wanted to celebrate what God did on our physical campuses during Easter. Yes, so this Easter, this resurrection weekend, we started off um, with just such a powerful Good Friday service where Pastor John, he just shared the meaning behind what Christ did for us on the cross and what his love means for our lives. And then we had two amazing services at our United Campus in Peoria, one Saturday night with PHC Espanol, and then PHC Peoria had a full house turnout on Sunday. And then we had five super powerful, amazing Easter services services on our Glendale campus. And then we wrapped it all up that weekend, praising God with our fifth Sunday worship night. And here's what we're thanking God for. We had record attendance on our physical campuses with over 6,000 people coming for Easter services. During those services, 46 people, they made a public profession of their faith through baptism. And here's what I love the most. Seven people rededicated their lives for Christ and 55 people accepted Christ into their life for the very first time. And listen, those are big numbers and big numbers, they're exciting to celebrate, but know that every single number represents a real person, a real person who God loves so deeply that he sent his son Jesus to die for. Real people who God let us be part of showing his love this Easter to. Yeah. I really love how he continued to exceed our expectations. You know, we, we pray for things, we believe, 
but then he does more than we really expect. And so let's thank God. Would you just join me that we could pray and just thank God for what he did this Easter. Heavenly Father, God, we are, we're humbled. We are called to show up. We're called to walk in the things you call us to, God. But then you do above and beyond what we would expect, what we would imagine, God. And we know that you're reaching each and every one of those people in their lives. You're planting seeds, that lives are being changed, lives are being transformed, that there's entire families, their futures are now pivoting in a whole new direction, God, because of things that happened this Easter. God, we're so grateful that you let us be a part of it, God. We love you and we just pray for each and every person that accepted you this Easter, God, that you're gonna to begin to build and make a new life, a new future in each and every one of their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And hey, if you wanna be part of giving into the mission of Pure Heart and everything that God is doing in the lives of our church family, you can do that by texting to give. You can give at pureheart.org forward slash give, or you can give in the Pure Heart app. And thank you to all of you whose faithful giving allows us to continue to help lift up those who are broken, hurting, and lost. And we know that so many of you are going through so much and we don't want you to be alone. And so we wanna join with you in prayer and be lifting up those needs to God. If you go to pureheart.org forward slash prayer and submit those prayer requests, we would love to partner in prayer with you. We love you, Pure Heart family. Make sure you go check out the Pure Heart podcast, that dropping where we're going to be unpacking some really cool stuff. We love you guys and we'll see you next week.